Now we're on Facebook Live, and this is episode 59 of The Conspiracy, and we're talking about Brian Jones. Yeah, a um, little deviation from current events that we've been discussing for the last few times, right? Oh, yeah. Glad, glad to get away from it a little bit. Yeah, because... Um, you know, Brian Jones is uh, one of the one of the well. I mean, obviously, he was one of the greatest rock stars ever. Um, but the whole circumstances around his death uh, are so mysterious that it really is a conspiracy by every definition. Okay, um, this show will probably play a little bit like a rock show at first because I want to kind of give a backstory, a pretty lengthy backstory about Brian. Because I think that to understand his kind of personality and uh, the way he was, I think it kind of understands his death a little bit, too. Um, you know, when he died, it's been 51 years. He died July 2nd, 1969. Uh, he was the first of that 27 club that we all know about. Yeah. Okay. First was him, then Hendrix, Joplin, and two years to the day, Jim Morrison. Yeah, they were dropping like flies there. Yeah, yeah. And um, it, it's interesting because, when, when you know, at the end of the show, when we get into the conspiracy, uh, the second half of the show, there, there's a lot to that. Uh, these, these were all pop stars, and they represented the counterculture. They were a threat. And uh, Brian Jones was a threat. It's, it's a little hard to understand, uh, you know, 50 years later because – the beginning of the Rolling Stones, Brian was the star. He founded the band. Okay. And most of the attention was, was put on him before it was ever put on Mick Jagger and Keith Richards. So, uh, you know, once he was gone, you know, 50 fired, years later. fired and then fired and then unfortunately passing away, that whole dynamic would change in the Rolling Stones. But in the 60s, it was Brian Jones's band. You understand what I'm saying, Rob? Yeah, he was the uh, he was like he was the Rolling Stones before there was the Rolling Stones. Yeah, I mean he was the one. You know, he got you know just as much, if not more, fan mail than any of the other guys. Um, you know, the media paid attention to him more than the others. He spoke in interviews more than the others. Uh, it was his band, and you know, there, there's a big difference between the Brian Jones era of the Rolling Stones and, and anything they've ever done since. So let's get into it. Okay. All right. Let's go for it. What so, you got? Brian was born February 28th, 1942 in the Cheltenham section of England. Uh, he was kind of sickly as a kid. Uh, he had developed what was called the croup in those days. What okay, is that? But, it's a lung condition. It's it's an infection in your lungs, and it creates like, a, like an inflammation of your trachea. Is it got, a, it's an early form of COVID-19? <laughs> oh well, there are some similarities. Think uh, about that. It, he got it at age four. All right. And it left him with asthma for the rest of his life. Wow. Okay. It's also something people used to get uh, in relation to diphtheria. So you don't get this much anymore because there's vaccines for it, okay? But back in the 40s, you could still get this, um, and it had an effect on him his whole life. He had asthma for the rest of his life. Now, he had a sister, Pamela, who died of leukemia in 1945. She was a year younger than him. Uh, she was two years old when she died. And then he had a sister, Barbara, born in 1946. Now, some people say that uh, some close to the family say that the mother, his mother kind of like was so distraught over the death of her daughter, Pamela, <clears throat> that when she had the next kid, Barbara, she kind of put all of her attention into Barbara and, and Brian was kind of pushed aside a little bit. Wow. Yeah. Now, as a kid, he was very smart. Uh, he was interested in, in school, but, but he was also interested in swimming and diving, and his first instrument that he played was the clarinet, all right? And he started playing that at the age of 11. Both of his parents were musically, uh, very musical. They played the piano, they played uh, classical music, things like that. And that was uh, a career that, that Brian 
his family wanted him to pursue. Since he had a, an interest in music, that's the direction he wanted them, they wanted him to go. Now, he was a smart kid, like I said, but he was a nonconformist, total nonconformist. Uh, he never wanted to wear his school uniform. Uh, he hated it. Um, he started getting into jazz uh, early on in his life as a teenager. Now, you know, jazz in those days, in the 50s, early 50s, was a bit taboo, especially in England. Okay? Yeah. Uh, in America, it was a little more accepted by then, but in England, it was still a little a little out there, uh, especially when you had parents that wanted you to be classically trained. He was into jazz. It was totally different. So um, eventually, jazz led to blues. He got into that. He got into Elmore James, uh, Robert Johnson, and he taught himself how to play saxophone and guitar by the age 17. Wow. Now, yeah, very, very musically inclined. Um, at 17, he was playing in jazz clubs, okay? Uh, he would play his guitar, and he often played for money on the street for cigarettes, just to pay for cigarettes. So between 1959 and 1961, he lived a very bohemian lifestyle, okay? He was only about 17 at the time. Um, he actually left home, and he traveled across northern Europe um, playing his guitar, kind of just living it, you know, hand to mouth, day to day. He did that for, I think, about a, about a year. And then he eventually came back because he ran out of money. <laughs> but um, during that period, he actually got three different women pregnant. <laughs> All right. Now, this caused a lot of problems. I mean, it would cause problems now. It caused a lot of problems then. Um, in late 61, he moved to London where he jammed with a lot of musicians that were kind of on this burgeoning R&B scene. Um, there was a guy named Alexis Corner, and Alexis is known as like the, the father of, of British blues. Um, he jammed with him. He jammed with Manfred Mann singer Paul Jones and the future cream bassist Jack Bruce. Wow. Yeah. And eventually he put an ad out in the jazz news in the spring of 1962 inviting any R&B musicians down to the Bricklayer's Arms Pub to audition for a band he wanted to put together. Uh, the first person to come down was um, piano player Ian Stewart. And then Mick Jagger came down with Keith Richards. And they had a bass player named Dick Taylor. Now, do you remember Dick Taylor, the guitarist from The Pretty Things? Yeah. Okay, he, he started out in The Stones. Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah. He, he played guitar, but he switched to bass. Um, and he played with them just very briefly before he got the pretty things together. Uh, they had a drummer named Tony Chapman at that point. Now, Brian Jones got the name for the Rolling Stones. And it was from a Muddy Waters song that he happened to be listening to one day. It's called Rolling Stone Blues. <laughs> that's, that's how they got the name. All right. So, this lineup of the Rolling Stones would last until January 1963 after the departure of Dick Taylor and Tony Chapman and the arrival of Charlie Watts on drums and Bill Wyman on bass. Okay. okay? So now you got the Stones okay, yeah. that, that we all know. Now, also in this time, Keith, Mick, and Brian lived in the same apartment. And uh, Brian was teaching Mick how to play harmonica. Okay, and uh, Brian was a fantastic harmonica player, and, and Mick Jagger um, learned everything he knows from Brian, and, and, and Mick is a fantastic harmonica player, too. Wow. Um, the band began gigging around London at various R&B clubs that were popping up. They were very popular at a place called the Crawdaddy Club, where they met manager Giorgio Gomelski. Um, it was at this time in mid-1963 that Gomelski was brought on to manage but Brian kind of did the managing of the band finances. He was like the business manager. Okay. Now, Brian fancied himself at that point as kind of the leader of the band. And he, he did that for some time. Um, he was actually allowing himself five pounds more a week in pay than the other guys. Okay. And when they found out about this that year in 1963, it, you know, Keith Richards says like that was the beginning of the end for Brian. Wow. 
you know, because he was getting more money than the rest of them, because he considered himself the leader. Yeah. Um, in 1964, management was shifted over to Andrew Lug Oldman, Old Ham, I'm sorry, Oldman. And uh, his first management duties that he did in 1964 was to deal with two more pregnancies involving two different women that Brian knocked up. <laughs> okay. One of them was married. Oh, shit. Yeah. One of them was married. I think she was an American. Um, but they were paid off for their silence and their troubles. Okay. He managed to keep it quiet. Um, Brian could play, you know, many, many instruments. And as the Stones got more popular in those early years, any instrument that wasn't a guitar, a bass, or a drum was played by Brian. Wow. Okay? Now, they would experiment with uh, marimba. And marimba is what you hear in the beginning of Under My Thumb. Yeah. Sounds almost like a xylophone. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. um, they use that in a song called Out of Time as well. Uh, he plays the sitar on Paint It Black, the Indian instrument. Yeah. Okay. Uh, flutes, you know, like in Ruby Tuesday, uh, clarinets, saxophones, oboes, all those odd kind of instruments that you would hear in some of those 60s, early 60s stone songs. That was all Brian. That and was that was Brian definitely that. a different kind of sound, you know, because he was like... The sound was totally, totally, totally different, no? Yeah, I mean, they started out playing a lot of covers, a lot of blues covers, uh, Chuck Berry covers, things like that. And once they started writing, making keys, started writing, Brian was like such a great addition to what they were writing because he could put in... <sighs> This kind of experimental, you know, you today you'd call it world music. They didn't have yeah. a title for it then, okay? But that's what it was, and he was very interested in in that. Um, now, when Oldham took over as manager, it kind of began a slow kind of estrangement for Brian from the rest of the band. Uh, Keith and Mick kind of became front and center because Oldham demanded that they write their own music. They weren't really writing anything. They were doing a lot of covers. And he realized, Oldham, that the way this band was going to make it big and last is to write their own stuff. Yeah, I mean, of you course. can't keep covering people's music forever, no matter how no. obscure covers and blues. I mean, because nobody in the 60s in England, you know, that whole blues thing was kind of like a, a scene. You know, it was a scene, a small scene in London that was popular in some of the other cities, uh, mostly London. And it kind of just bursted out of that. But, you know, you just can't keep doing other people's songs. So they, they you know, Oldham actually locked Keith and Mick in a kitchen and said, I'm not letting you out until you write a song. Because they, <laughs> they, they, felt, they felt they couldn't, they couldn't do it. They felt they, didn't, they weren't good enough. They were very insecure in the beginning. And, you know, he said, you're not getting out of this kitchen until you write a song. And a few hours later, they came out with the song, Tell Me. And Tell Me, first, wow. That was the first song they ever wrote. Now, Brian was, was still recognized mostly as band leader in 1964. But slowly, because of this, what I'm saying about the writing, that perception would slip to Mick and Keith. Now, Brian... Yeah very talented musically he couldn't you know he could play a lot of instruments but he couldn't really write a song no nah, he couldn't write a song he couldn't, okay uh he just kind of preferred to do these obscure blues songs and things like that and mick were mick and keith were writing originals and by the time 1965 came and satisfaction was a worldwide number one hit oh yeah um, that was in june of 65 Brian became even more ostracized from the band because I think he, he, it was a blow to his confidence that, that these guys that, you know, he put the band together, but these guys who came to him to be in the band are now writing the songs and they're doing, they're recording their other songs as well. And this was a number one hit. It really was a blow to his confidence and he started drinking heavily. Um, he, he drank a lot heavily anyway, but it, it got worse. 
and he started getting into drugs, a lot of prescription pills, things like that. Now, in 1965, he met model actress and socialite Anita Paulenberg. Yeah. And the two kind of instantly became an item. Uh, she had her claws in him pretty quickly. Now, he was, he was well, you know, if you ever seen pictures of her, she was beautiful, okay? Uh, everything that, like, 1960s um, model woman would look like that you would imagine, okay? Blonde, okay? Uh, I think she was German, I'm pretty sure, but very well-educated, very, uh, you know, high class, but she had a trashiness about her that was, that was interesting, um, Almost like that Emma Peel's kind of uh, appeal. Uh, Emma Peel, I would give her a little more class, but but uh, but in that in that in that vein. Because if you remember, she just the woman that just played her died, and if you remember, Emma Peel, right, Diana Rigg just passed away. The Diana day. Rigg. Yeah, yeah, and she was the Bond girl, and she was James Bond's <laughs> wife in on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um. <laughs> He fell in love with Anita right away, um, but as much as she was beautiful, he kind of descended further into alcoholism and drug abuse while he was with her. Damn. Uh, they, they they did drugs together. It wasn't uh, it wasn't just him. Okay, uh, he was one of the first people to ever do acid. He was <laughs> he was he was like one of the first rock stars to ever do acid. Like nobody wow. was doing it in '65. Um, he was. He was, yeah, and and he he didn't care. He had a rebellious streak in him, and he would do whatever he wanted to do. And you know, it, again, it kind of plays to that 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 idea that the Stones were dangerous. Uh, parents were afraid when their kids were listening to the Stones. They looked at these guys, and they're like, they're a bunch of long head. Freaks, freaks, and yeah. Drug out, drug addicts. Look at them; their teeth are all fucked up. You know, you know. It was like, you know, they, they, they just scared people. They scared the establishment. It's hard to imagine that now because they've been around for so long. Yeah, who the hell okay. are they going to scare now? <laughs> nah, nobody. Okay, but you know, when it when it started, that whole scene. I mean, the Beatles scared people at first, but there was a there was a concerted effort to kind of tone down the Beatles at first. The Stones was the opposite. They were, the, you know, Andrew Luke Oldham wanted to make them the antithesis of the Beatles, the opposite of the Beatles. Yeah. So they played up that bad boy image a little bit, okay? Um, they would write songs with a little bit of a sexual overtone and things oh, like yeah. that, more than the Beatles ever did. But um, through most of 1965, Keith and Brian were, were not really close, Okay. Uh, band tensions and Brian, uh, when Brian was often starting to be absent from yeah. the band sessions, uh, he was starting to get in poor shape physically from the, the drugs and the alcohol. Uh, didn't, didn't Richard steal his, like his, well, the we'll, love. Get to that. We're, we're, we're getting to that point. Okay. That's really the, the tragedy of, of Brian Jones. Um, but in 1966, there was an effort between Keith and, and Brian to try to rekindle their friendship. Uh, Keith had just broken up with an actress. Uh, not, I'm sorry, I don't remember if she was an actress, but his girlfriend was named Linda Keith. Okay, and she just dumped him. And he was <laughs> yeah, and he was like really upset. And he kind of like Brian and him started talking again, and they became friends again, kind of closer, and. He ended up moving in with 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 Brian and and Anita. They ended up living together. Actually, Brian and Anita ended up going to his place at Redlands, okay, which is like a big mansion in England. Um, he was at the time in early '67. Um, Brian was working on the film score of one of Anita's movies called A Degree of Murder, okay. Um, and he had was doing the guitar and all the scoring of the movie. One night there was a party going on, okay, at Redlands. Uh, Mick Jagger was there, Marianne Faithful, a uh, bunch of other people. Um, and 
Brian and Anita were supposed to come back later. Now, Brian calls up and Keith answers the phone. And Brian's telling him how he's going to be there later. And right at that point, the place gets uh, raided by the police. Okay. Whoa. The party gets raided. And it was like right when he was on the phone. And Keith tells him, he's like, don't bother coming back. We just got busted. All right. Holy shit. Yeah. So they, they found marijuana, Benzedrine pills, okay, <laughs> and a few tablets of heroin. Oh, okay. shit. Now, people forget, heroin used to come in pill form. Yeah. Okay, and up until I think it wasn't like that in America anymore. In America in the 1920s, you can get a prescription for heroin in pill form. Okay, but they had stopped making that. But in England, I believe you could still get that even into wow. the 60s. So um, Mick and Keith were given bail. And in the press, they kind of played it off like nothing serious, you know. But in reality, it was. Uh, the police in England wanted to make examples out of the Stones. And the band knew it. Brian knew it. They all knew it. Okay. They said, you know, they're, they're just trying to fuck with us because they, they, they want to get rid of us. Okay. Because it was such a stupid charge. All right. Um, and, and the heroin wasn't found on Mick or Keith. It was like somebody else. Okay. All right. So yeah, that was that's there. good. That's a good sign. Yeah. It was just like weed and these, and these Benzedrine pills. And the pills were actually mm -hmm. like a prescription that Mick had got in, in Italy or something like that, that he still had. So they were legit. Um, they decided while they were out on bail, uh, Keith decided that they were going to take a trip down to Morocco. Now, they weren't going to fly. Keith was going to drive from England to, Mor to Morocco. Man. Holy to shit. It's a 2,000 mile trip. That's crazy. It is crazy. Now, Jagger was going to meet them down there, but he wasn't going to go on that trip. Okay. It was Keith, Anita, Brian, and they had a driver named Tom Keylock. It was Keith's Rolls Royce, Rolls Royce. And uh, Tom drove it down. He chauffeured them down. Uh, Keylock is a figure that's going to come in to importance later. Okay. He was kind of like a jack of all trades. He did everything. He was a chauffeur. He would get, you know, get things for you if you needed it. Uh, anything. You know, he was that. He had connections in the police department. He had connections in, in the underworld. He was like a very kind of shady character, a guy who could help you in, in a lot of different ways. So Keith. Not a bad around. driver. Not a and, bad and driver. He was a, and he was a good driver. Right. So um, it was Keith, Anita, and Brian, and they got in Keith's Bentley Continental, and they drove 2,000 miles south, okay, through France and Spain. Now, they stopped in Paris to pick up another girl named Deborah, who was the girlfriend of filmmaker Donald Camel. Now, when traveling through the mountains between in the, in the southern part of France, okay, Brian started to get sick. The, the thin air was getting to him, and he broke out in a fever. Uh, you know, it was his asthma acting up. And they had to stop in a hospital in Toulouse in the southern part of France. And they immediately took Brian in. They thought he might have pneumonia. Wow. So, you know. Brian didn't want to be a pain, so he urged them, continue on, and I'll meet you in Tangiers in Morocco. I'll fly down in a few days when I feel better. Uh -oh. So they did. They did. Now, immediately, Brian regretted this because Brian started to have a feeling over the prior months that something was developing between Keith and Anita. All right. Now, nothing had happened at that, you know, up until then. OK, but it was just a feeling he had from being around them, how they were acting around each other and, and things like that. So what he did was he immediately started sending telegrams down to the hotel in Morocco that they were going to be at. And he was basically asking Anita to come back to Toulouse and then they'll fly back. To Morocco together. All right. But what had happened is when they had left him in Toulouse in the hospital, 
they had to travel through Spain. And when they did, they had made a stop off in Valencia. And that's when the two of them hooked up. Okay. Wow. Uh, apparently, according to Anita Paulenberg's uh, book, she said that they, they couldn't resist each other anymore. And he spent the night in her hotel room in Valencia. Wow. So, this was driving him crazy that he had let them go like this. Okay. So he had sent them all those telegrams, but by the time they, they got there, the deed had already happened. Now he didn't yeah. know, but Anita actually paid attention to what Brian was asking and went back, took a flight back to Toulouse and met him in the yeah. hospital. And he knew as soon as she walked in that something had happened. He wow. He knew. He knew. And, you know, it, it, it was a problem because Brian lost his shit. All right. He started treating her horribly. Uh, you know, they flew back to Morocco together. Okay. And they met up with Keith and Deborah. And then also Mick Jagger was there with Marianne Faithful and a few others. So he knew when he saw her needed. Okay? He knew he, the he deal knew, was he knew, already he knew right done. away. And during that Morocco trip, when they were there for a couple of days, there were a couple of times where he would be out of it and he would start hitting her, okay, and stuff like that. And tensions were very high. And, and, and Keith knew that he was treating Anita bad, uh, but there, there was nothing he could do. Um, now, one thing that, you know, being the 60s and being – uh, the height of kind of like hedonistic behavior. One night he was wasted in Morocco and he came back to the hotel room with a prostitute. Oh, shit. Okay. And the idea was that they would have a menage a trois. Okay. <laughs> it would be Anita, the prostitute, and, and Brian. And apparently they had been doing this kind of thing before. It wasn't just out of the blue. Okay? Oh, so this wasn't the first this was, time. Then. No, it wasn't the first time. But she was so sick and tired of Brian at this point, the way he was treating her, that she just was like, fuck you, I'm not doing this. And he ended up hitting her again after that. Ooh. Now, the next morning, um, Anita went swimming in the pool in the hotel. And yeah. it was obvious to Brian that she was smiling at Keith a little too much. And he would kind of like sneak a smile back at her. Okay. And something was going on. So wow. it was at this point that this plot was hatched to ditch Brian. Okay? Oh, yeah, so he's done. Well, Anita and Keith would take off in the Rolls Royce and leave the hotel together while Brian was recording some of the local music at the town square. Okay, so he went into the town square with his friend, mm. uh, another guy named Brian, uh, Brian Geisen. He was an artist. Uh he and Brian Geisen didn't know what they were the others were planning to do. Okay, he just went with Brian to keep him company. And he was down there recording on a cassette. The, these they would play these like pipes, like the locals and stuff like that. And he liked the sound, so he was recording it. Um, but Tom Keylock was the chauffeur again, okay, and he drove Anita and Keith onto the ferry to Spain. And then up to Madrid, where they grabbed a flight to London. Wow. Okay. And that's something that takes about a couple of hours. So when Brian got back, he realized everybody left him. And not only that, they left him with the tab. Oh, the hotel tab, right? I think they did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh. <clears throat> so, you know, it was crazy. And, and he actually almost became suicidal about it. He was making calls to people, uh, his friends back home and stuff, and, and he couldn't believe what had happened. Um, it was at that point that he, he knew he lost Anita. He lost Anita to Keith, which was even worse. And then he thought he probably lost the band as well. Yeah, everything. Okay? Everything's gone. Yeah. yeah. Now, he would make his way back to London – and um, he would find Keith and Anita together in a small flat in St. John's Wood, an area in London. Uh, not the regular place where, where Keith was living at Redlands, 
um, he begged Anita to come back to him. Wow. And her quote was, no, you're too much of an asshole to live with. Keith and I have got <laughs> Keith and I have got something going now. Okay. So it was the biggest slap down that he ever got in his life. It's fucked up, man. Yeah, yeah. And it destroyed the friendship between him and Keith forever, pretty much. Okay. And uh Brian, though he was still a member of the Stones, he didn't lose the band. Uh he was a broken man. He his drug use increased, his drinking increased, and at one point, he even checked himself into a hospital for depression in March of 1967. That was about two months after the incident. Uh, but he wouldn't stay long because the Stones had to go on a European tour. And that had started in Sweden. So he had to leave the hospital to go there. So, I mean, for the next two years, he would perform on stage with the Stones and have to look at Keith right next to him and be reminded <laughs> of of his own kind of inadequacies and everything, you know, it was, it he's was, banging my girlfriend. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was really Anita. Anita was the only girl he ever like really truly loved. That's what everybody says. Cause um, he's the only, that's the only one that sticked around long enough. Right. I think. And he didn't even got her knocked up or anything. No, he, uh, yeah, actually he didn't knock her up. Okay. And, uh, which I guess maybe he loved her for that. I don't know. <laughs> But, but he got like he got like five women knocked up, right? Yeah. That's what it is. Like when yeah. it's a total, five or six, something like that. Yeah, yeah, savage. Now, in May of '67, Brian was busted for marijuana, cocaine, and speed in his apartment. Okay, he confessed to the marijuana charge, but he denied the other charges. He claimed it was a setup. Now it was. Okay, the police showed up, found the weed. But all of a sudden, this little tiny vial showed up that had a <laughs> tiny, tiny amount of cocaine in it. It was like not even worth anything to charge. But, you know, what happened was Scotland Yard made up a story that there was more of it in there. Okay. Wow. So he got busted for those three things. And he actually, he actually, uh, said that he was guilty. He pleaded guilty, which was a mistake. Okay, he shouldn't have done that. Yeah, but don't um, you plead guilty like that? Don't you get jail time now? Well, he, he did. He got nine months, but he appealed it, Wow. and they gave him probation. So he never actually, uh, I think so. he did a, a day or two in jail, and that was about it. Um, later on, right after that, he would go to the Monterey Pop Festival in California in June of 67, and he actually introduced Jimi Hendrix to the American crowd. And that was wow. Hendri that was Hendrix's uh, introduction, or America's introduction to Hendrix, I should say. Okay, because he really wasn't known yet at that point. Now, Jones would continue to play on a lot of substantial Stones music, including Jumpin' Jack Flash, Satanic Majesty's Request, that album, uh, the Beggar's Banquet album, and he was in the film One Plus One, which is about the recording of the song Sympathy for the Devil. Wow. Now, Jones in that movie is, is shown clearly kind of neglected in the music-making process. He's kind of like, you see him a lot off to himself. He's playing guitar, and he is all over that song, okay, Sympathy for the Devil. But he's uh, not writing it or anything, right? No. Because he's just playing no, for he it. No, but... he was just help, you know, helping, with, I guess, with the arrangements and, and, yeah. and, you know, with the little parts here and there. But mostly he was playing an acoustic guitar during yeah. that song. Um, uh, there's a couple of scenes where you see him chatting with Keith, which is kind of interesting. You've got to wonder what they're talking about. And smoking cigarettes with him <laughs> and stuff like that. But... Brian gets arrested again in May of 68 for marijuana possession. Now, it was a problem because he was actually on probation from the last thing a year earlier. Yeah. Okay. And he faced real jail time here. But the judge found him guilty, but also was lenient and really only gave him a fine and warned him to stay out of trouble. So he got lucky. He got Early, very yeah, lucky. Very lucky, because in those days you could go to jail for two years for one joint. Yeah, you know, that, that's the way it was. You, you it was. Up. 
You yeah, I mean, yeah, and 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 the the you know Scotland Yard in England, they were they were after these these people. They 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 saw this counterculture, this rock and roll life, as a threat to everyday life for people. That was the position. Uh, it was like that in America too. Okay, uh, Richard Nixon had John Lennon watched by the FBI. Okay, uh, there's an FBI file on John Lennon. I believe it. Yeah. Um, in early 69, the, bland, the band planned to tour the United States for the first time in three years. They hadn't been there since 66. And, but, but Brian was in no condition to go. Okay. He could barely play any instruments anymore. Um, he could play a little guitar, but if he played the harmonica, like his mouth used to bleed Ooh. and stuff. Yeah, he had like... If you see pictures of him from that those those times in '69, he was very puffy, kind of chubby, okay, and that that just comes from a lot of alcohol and, and prescription drug abuse. Um, also, the arrest that he had would be a problem with him getting a work visa in America. So once the tour was being planned, yeah, he couldn't go. Know, yeah, he he they thought he couldn't go. They thought he would be a problem. So. They were working on a new album, uh, which would be called Let It Bleed. And he only really, yeah, it was a take on the Beatles' Let It Be. Okay. Yeah. Um, he only contributed two songs on that. Uh, one song called Midnight Rambler, which is a, a classic song. Uh, he does a lot of the, the harmonica on there. And ironically, he does a Keith Richards song called You Got the Silver. And it's one that Keith actually sings. Oh, yeah? And he plays what's called the auto harp on that, okay? Um, some photo sessions were scheduled for May, and Mick Jagger told Jones that he would be fired if he didn't attend these sessions, these photo wow. sessions. Wow. Uh, things were that bad. Um, you know, all accounts say that, that Keith and Mick and even, I guess, Bill Wyman and Charlie Watts to some degree – were, were constantly shitting on Brian. They'd say, oh, you're washed up, you suck now. Just, you know. But don't he, even... was, he was young. Yeah, but it, he was burnt. I mean, it was like he was so fucked up from the drugs and the alcohol that he could barely play. They would prop, they would prop him up in the studio. <laughs> yeah, it was, that, it was that bad. Like Weekend at Bernie's? Like Weekend at Bernie's, Exactly. Wow. Except, except he wasn't dead yet, but it was like he was, you know, he, he really wasn't, <laughs> he wasn't contributing much. Now, I'm just going to show everybody something here. These are the photos that were taken. Now, if you ever saw this album, this is called Through the Past Darkly, Big Hits Volume 2. Uh, wow. There's, there's, there's Brian right, I don't know if you can see it. See right here where I'm, where I'm pointing? There's yeah. Brian right there. Okay, this is a cool album because of the shape of it. See it? Yeah. Shaped like oh, a stop yeah. sign, you know? Yeah. And the back of it is like a shattered mirror. See that? Yeah, that's things to come. Well, yeah. And, and you know, later on, years later, people would, would point to that album cover and it would be like, oh, wow, it's some kind of prediction, you know? Yeah, it does because everything shattered, but the, it was only shattered for... Um, Brian Jones, because the history, you see the history of the Stones now. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, that collection would actually come out after he passed away, okay, in September of 69. Uh, Let It Bleed would be released in July, um, and a tour schedule for November was, was picked, okay, to come to the United States. But Jones, it, like they said, he couldn't get the work visa. So the Stones got guitarist Mick Taylor, who was formerly in John Mayall's Blues Breakers, to replace him. And on June 8th, 1969, Mick Jagger, Keith Richards, and Charlie Watts went to Brian Jones' house and told him he was fired from the band. Wow, that's that Vista. Yep, that was the end, June 8th, 1969. Now, the press would be told the story that Brian left on his own, okay? And, and they had asked Brian, how do you want to handle this? We'll go along with whatever you want to do. And he decided that he would put out a statement 
And on June 9th, he released a statement saying that he no longer sees eye to eye with the others over discs that they were cutting. So he just said it was like musical differences, creative differences. Now, since November of 1968, Brian was living at Cotchford Farm in East Sussex, which is a pretty rural area um, outside of London. And it was actually a residence that was formerly owned by the Winnie the Pooh author. Oh, yeah, the guy yeah. who wrote a whole book a, about a, it. A.A. A. Milne, okay? Yeah. The guy who wrote Winnie the Pooh, all those children's stories? Yeah. He, he lived in that house before Brian, okay? Now, here's where we're going to get into the, the conspiracy part, okay? Brian had been having his house and grounds worked on. Now, he had been a little low on cash to pay for the work. Yeah. Um, there was some money that was being advanced to him from the record company and from Alan Klein, who was their new manager at that point. Um, and, and Brian was asking for a lot of advances to pay for this work that he was being done. And um, at times, the workers weren't getting paid. And there was a guy, he was a builder, he was in charge of the workers. His name was Frank Thorogood. Okay? And this is very important. Um, Frank is... Uh, the only thing, way I could describe this guy is like a piece of shit. I hate to say it, okay? <laughs> uh, he, he, him and the other workers really took advantage of Brian, okay? In the months prior to Brian getting fired from the stones they had actually uh well thoroughgood and i think a few of the build of the builders actually moved on to the grounds okay they they were never told to they did okay but they did it anyway yeah and you know brian was out of it and i think a lot of this built up over months and they were partying in his house okay with the workers? Uh, the workers, yeah. They, and they would be partying with Brian. And he really didn't say anything, but it was kind of like, what are they doing here? Yeah. Okay? They were taking advantage of him. And they were probably doing, he probably had drugs, and they are probably oh, doing yeah. his yeah, drugs, everybody too. Was, everybody was getting high, okay? Now, um, on the night of July 2nd, 1969, Brian was found dead at the bottom of the swimming pool at Codford Farm. Now, the police declared it a death by misadventure. Okay? Kind of a strange title. Yeah, but, why, what, is, what is that? Death by what? Misadventure. What does that mean? Misadventure. It means that it was an accident. Okay. Okay? In this case, an accidental overdose. Okay, an accidental death from alcohol and drugs. Okay, and they just called it misadventure. Now, at, there was kind of a, at that night, there was kind of an impromptu party that broke out. Okay, earlier in the day, Brian fired Frank Thurgood. Okay, Ooh. fired him. Said that you're doing shitty work. You're not getting anything done, and I'm, I'm done with you and all your workers. Get out of here, okay? <laughs> but they didn't leave. Frank didn't leave, okay? And, you know, it, it's unclear what exactly happened to make a party go on, okay? But people showed up. Uh, Brian wasn't really throwing a party. It was just people started coming over. Yeah. And... You, uh, you know, some accounts say there was almost 20 people there. Now, when Brian at the time had a girlfriend named Anna Wilson, okay? And there was also um, a girl there named Janet Lawson, okay? Now, Janet Lawson and Tom Keelock had something going on. Ooh. Okay? But Keelock was married okay and in the original police report he would not be mentioned as being there okay but he was there he was there it was he his was house there. 
Well, no, it wasn't Keylock's house. It was it was Brian's house. No, I mean Brian's house. Yeah. Right. Right. Now, there was also another woman there named Joan Fitzsimmons. Okay. And she was having an affair with Thorogood. Oh shit. Okay, and Thorogood was married. So there was a lot of people hanging out. Everybody was fucking everybody. Okay, <laughs> seems like. All right. Like, well, yeah. Yeah, uh, a lot going on. And Thorogood was pissed. Not only that he got fired, okay, he was pissed that Brian owed him 6,000 pounds. Ooh, that's a lot of which, money. It, which was a lot of money, and, it, you know, now it would be a lot more, okay? They were arguing about that during the day, but... When the party was going on, um, everything kinda, seemed fine. Yeah, sort of. Okay, and everybody was kind of doing their own thing. Uh, Tom Keelock would 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 say many years later that people were were eating hash brownies. <laughs> All right, and he said he was the only one that didn't have any, so he was the only one that was sober that night. Wow. Yeah. Now, what's interesting is. When they found what happened is 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 Frank approached Janet Lawson in the kitchen a little bit after nine o'clock that night. Now he had been outside with Brian, kind of horsing around by the pool, sort of play fighting, I think. Okay, and earlier, a few minutes earlier, Brian had asked Janet, "Can you find my inhaler? I need my inhaler. Where is it?" He used to always keep it by the side of the pool. Yeah, right, for his. For his asthma. So Janet went inside to look for it. Brian's girlfriend was in another part of the house. She was wasted. Okay. And all of a sudden, Frank comes into the kitchen and tells her, this is like maybe five, ten minutes later after she just spoke to Brian. Yeah. Comes in saying, Brian's at the bottom of the pool. And he was like visibly shaken up. So they ran outside together and they dove in. They pulled him out, okay? Anna, his his girlfriend, okay, came outside, hysterical, okay? Gra the three of them grabbed him out of the pool. Um, they were trying to revive him. Now, Anna swears to this day that she felt a pulse. Like, she felt his hand grab her. Oh, okay? shit. Gra grab her hand. But he was dead. Right after that. And it was a little bit after nine that night that this happened. Frank, interestingly, had a hand injury. Okay. And after the police would show up and everything, he would eventually go to the hospital and get that hand treated. Okay. When the police showed up, this is where it gets strange. Um, they didn't ask the right questions. Okay. They kind of led people on, like, oh, there's drugs here, right? There's drugs here, right? You know, like, ask, ask, like, kind of answering the questions for them. Yeah. Okay. Um, they felt that if they could just get done with this, they, they, they would get through the evening, get through this thing. You know, they just wanted the police out of there. So, yeah. A lot of them, you know, years later would change their stories and say, oh, you know, uh, I didn't say this. I really meant that. And, and, but, Tom, uh, Tom Keelock had a brother, an older okay. brother, who, his name was Frank, who worked at Scotland Yard. Holy shit. Now, it's very possible, and, and, and I, you know, he didn't actually say it years later when he was speaking of this, but his brother was informed about what went on. And basically, in the, in, in, in the middle of this whole short investigation that night, Another gentleman from, I guess, from Scotland Yard came down and spoke to the regular police on the scene, the detectives yeah. on the scene, and shut down the investigation. Basically, the whole story was fabricated. They made it that there were only three other people there. Okay. Oh, and it was on a party. Keylock, Keylock was no longer on the scene. Fitzsimmons, Joan Fitzsimmons was no longer on the scene. The only people on the scene was Frank Thorogood. Brian Jones, Anna, Anna Wollen, and, and uh, uh, what was her name? Uh, Janet Lawson. Okay. But they, some people say there were as many as 20 people then. 
So what do you think? You think it, I, they, I think there were well, there 20 was. people there. I, I'm sure there. I'm sure there was. Okay, because some of the builders were on site as well. Okay. Um, you know, I think what happened is when when Frank Frank uh, Helock, Tom, Tom's brother, was notified about this, uh, I think they looked at it as an opportunity. Okay, an opportunity to kind of like make it all about drugs and alcohol. Okay, and that's it. All right. Why and, don't you just give him a death bro? Why don't you just put the, a bunch of shit in a drink and give it to him? You know what they they well, I mean, they, he had died. He was already dead. Okay, so but I mean, bef they could have right beforehand. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean. <laughs> I don't think that Thorogood planned to kill him. I think it was probably an accident. Okay, but he did it. Now, wow. he, on his deathbed, actually said that he did it, and it was sort of an accident. Okay. Let me, uh, let me just plug in my phone. It's almost dying here. Hold on. All right. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, now, when they did the when they did the uh, the autopsy on Brian, okay, they said that he drowned. But guess what? They found no chlorinated water in his lungs. Wow. Okay, which means that he didn't die in the pool. No. Next to the pool was a trough, a long trough, like a barrel. And it was filled with fresh water. Wow. Now, possible he could have drowned in that. Frank could have pushed him into that, not pushed him in the trough, but dunked him. Yeah, dumped him, yeah. Dumped him in. They were horsing around, okay? And, uh, you know, he probably died there, and maybe Frank threw him in the pool. In the pool. Yeah. Now, when they looked at his body, they found that his liver and his heart was very enlarged. And that was from years of drug and alcohol. Wow. Okay. Uh, and he was only 27 years old. So, but they only found enough beer in him for three pints. <laughs> like any he drugs? He wasn't drunk. He wasn't drunk. But did they find any drugs like in the blood? A little bit of something that was considered an amphetamine. Okay. It was, it was a very small amount. A very small dosage, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, report you know, uh the girlfriend says that he was doing he was drinking a little bit and doing some sleeping pills while he was drinking. All right, so he probably had that in his system too. Okay, the sleeping pills. Yeah. Um, I don't know how that shows up. Maybe a barbiturate or something. But, <laughs> yeah, and 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 basically, um, the next weird part is that three weeks after Brian died, Joan Fitzsimmons was beaten up and left for dead. Wow. Okay. Now Frank Thorogood was supposedly seen at Cotchford Farms. After the death of Brian, asking where to find Joan Fitzsimmons and that she knew too much. Oh, shit. Yeah. Okay. Now, she was beaten up. She had teeth missing. She was she was almost dead. Okay. And it was all probably what she knew. Now, Frank Thurgood probably did it. Okay. Wow. He was also caught by several people burning papers at the house that kind of people suspect it might have been receipts from the building that he was doing for Brian or, or something. Okay. But yeah. Brian used to keep um, a lot of money in the house. Oh, is he trying to get back in the house? Yeah. At, at Cox's farm, he would keep it in his bedroom. And if anybody needed anything, he would just peel off a couple of bills and say, hey, all right, go get what you need. Wow. That money disappeared. Also, uh, yeah. Now, now, also, Tom Keylock made off with a lot of Brian's clothes, 
and his Rolls Royce. <laughs> okay. Uh, and like I said, on the deathbed of Frank Thorogood in the early 90s, he admitted to drowning Brian. But Holy then, shit. Then, then there's some people that say he didn't say that. Okay. This has been, you know, every couple of years, people try to reopen this case. Okay. And back in 2010, uh, a journalist was trying to, to reopen it. And the Sussex County Police refused to reopen the case. I wonder why. Well, not only did they refuse it, they told them that there's a 75 year seal. <laughs> oh, who did that? Oh, gee. I don't know. Okay, so I think what this comes down to is, oh, one thing too, it, uh, Brian's girlfriend, Anna Wolin, after Brian was, 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 um, was laid to rest, uh, buried, um, she was grabbed up by the Stones management and put on a plane to Sweden and said oh, she was from Sweden. And said, "Net, don't come back." Wow. Okay. Now, some people say, "Don't that come back." Something to do with it. Okay, because when Brian had left the band, he had a hundred thousand pounds that was supposed to come his way. Okay, in the agreement. Yeah. And also, an additional twenty thousand pounds per year. For the length of time that the band would exist. Now, could you imagine if he was still alive? He'd be a millionaire. He'd still, he'd still be getting money because the band is still around. Oh my God, that's like he had almost like a like a permanent royalty check. Kind of, yeah. They were going to take care of him. Okay? He was the Bobby Bonilla. But guess, but guess yeah, exactly. <laughs> he had the Bobby Bonilla <laughs> contract. Yeah, exactly. The gift that keeps on giving. I haven't played in the Stern for 75 years, but they still pay me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, uh, you know, there's been people that have said, oh, you know, Mickey Keith had him killed. I, I don't really believe that. I, I don't think that that's true. I think that he was probably worth more alive than to them than, than dead. I don't think they wanted to kill their friend. The very strange thing, though, is Marianne Faithful, who was Jagger's girlfriend, was always very upset with how the band reacted to the death of Brian. They kind of were like nonchalant about it. Like, like Jagger and Richards didn't go to the funeral. Wow. Okay. And Charlie Watts and Bill Wyman went, and other people from the Stones' entourage, Marianne Faithful and stuff. But, but not those two. All right. Now, Richards, I can understand because he had a falling out. But why Jack? I don't. I don't understand why Jagger didn't go. He said. He said that he had to make the film Ned Kelly down in Australia, and he was obligated contractually to go down there. But uh, you know, um, actually, Marion Faithful didn't go to the funeral because she went with with Mick down to Australia. But, wow. you know, uh, when people asked Mick, like, what are you going to do now? You know, and he, he was like, well, it goes on. Everything goes on like it always did. You know, he really didn't have a lot of remorse. It's, wow. You know, so who knows? They might have they might have got him killed. I don't I don't think so. I don't I, I don't think so. I think it's just what happened. I think if you ask me, you had. This was an accident. I don't think Thorogood meant to kill him. They were fucking he, around, playing around, and something happened, and he might have dunked him too hard, and he drowned. Or maybe he pushed him and he hit his head on the edge yeah. where he pushed him yeah, into the pool happen. playing around. Possibly, possibly. Uh, there was no head wound in the autopsy. So, oh, no? Hold on. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, there was no head wound. So they would have seen that. Okay. 
Um, I think that he, he probably drowned him in that trough. That's where the fresh water came into his lungs and said, wow, he's drowned. Okay, I'll put him at the bottom of the pool. And that's it. <laughs> and that's it. Okay. But the second part of the conspiracy is the police. Okay. Yeah. They, they, they showed up. Now, this was like a, you know, a bum fuck kind of town. So you probably had, you know, Buford T. Justice come down. Okay. And, 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 and be like, all right, Barney what happened here? And they, and Barney Fife, right. You know? Barney Fife. Then when they realized it was, you know, a big thing, now a head guy comes down from Scotland Yard and stops the investigation. And that's crazy. So now, you, yeah, and you're never going to find out everything that happened officially. OK, they, they changed the story around that people were not there that were there. OK, yeah. Keylock, Keylock was on the record as not there, but he was wow. there and admitted well, later was. that he was because he was with his girlfriend instead of his wife. So he couldn't be there officially. Oh, OK. okay. So he, he lied. Yeah. So and his brother co helped cover it up. OK. And I think that the government, OK, from Scot you know, Scotland Yard up, I think that. The idea was, if you take out the pop stars, you solve the drug problem. So let's take out this guy. Why did they just take out the whole band? Well, it, I don't know. You probably can't get away with that. You know, it wasn't about killing them. It was more about showing that their lifestyle will kill you. Oh, yeah, of course. And, you know what I'm saying? Not like, oh, okay, let's whack Brian Jones and, and you know. The idea was that you would show people what drugs and alcohol did and make it only about that. Even though he was murdered, or, uh, the correct term is really manslaughter because it wasn't murder. Okay, But he, he was killed accidentally by, by Thurgood and they covered it up. Instead of, instead of telling it like it was, they said, okay, there's drugs and alcohol involved. Let's leave it like that because that's the narrative that we want to stop this counterculture. Wow, you know what's funny? There's there's a documentary coming out, right? Like about that that whole uh, mystery around Brian Jones' death, right? Well, we um well we had the the Danny Garcia one that came out this year. Remember this? Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, we interviewed Danny Garcia, who directed this uh, about two months ago, and uh, this is a great movie. It's called Rolling Stone: The Life and Death of Brian Jones. Everybody should see this. It's like about it's an very hour good. And a great great show. Uh, and also, there was a, on the Smithsonian Channel, coincidentally, on Sunday of this week, uh, there was a, a documentary about his death. And uh, I didn't even know about it. But there's like a new show that's going to be like about different kind of conspiracies every week on the Smithsonian Channel. Yeah, you were telling me about that. They, are they going to do Brian Jones? They did it already. It was last weekend. Oh, they did it already? Did you see yeah. it? Yeah. No, What's, I, I didn't even no? know about it until I started. Oh doing it. shit! I'd be yeah. interested to see. I like to watch that. See what they say. See if they they pretty much got the same yeah. theory. Yeah, I mean, the Danny Garcia DVD really went into it deep, you know, and uh, I think they made it without a doubt that he was killed. Okay, he wow. Was killed. Yeah, he, so, he was probably he was probably killed. He was probably fucking there hanging out and boom, got pushed, hit his head, or something happened. And maybe you know, everybody he, he, co cover it up, you know? Maybe maybe he had some kind of asthma attack, but I think the autopsy didn't show that. Apparently, the autopsy, if I remember right, it showed that he knew he was drowning. There's something that happens to you when you drown, the way that your tissues react inside, yeah. that they could tell whether you're conscious or not. OK, like if you're passed out and you fall in the bottom of the pool and you drown. Yeah. The the your autopsy shows different than if you are being struggling like someone's killing you. Oh, OK. Shit. Yeah. And it showed that it showed that he was awake and conscious and knowing that he was and drowning. So, so somebody it, was killing him. The guy yeah, was, so the somebody Thurger was pushing him in that trough probably down and drowned him and then threw him in the pool to cover it up. He probably did like the fucking, um, what's it called? He probably did like a uh, Stewie. Where's my money? 
Where's my money? Yeah. Where's my six my thousand? Money. Where's my six thousand? Exactly. And fucking pushed him down and yep. killed him. And then he was like, fuck, I killed the guy. Yep. You know? That's all I then, got then, for you, Mr. Rossi. And uh, let me bring up, I'm going to bring up two, two funny conspiracy. Okay. Have you heard the one about fucking <laughs> Stevie Wonder playing pranks on Hollywood celebrities like he could see? Uh, no. <laughs> so there's this fucking story that's out about Stevie Wonder that Shaq was charting on TT. Shaq say, one day I parked my car and um, I'm going, we lived in the same building. So Shaq and uh, Stevie lived in the same building. And Shaq said, yeah, I, I, I get it. I get it. Um, I'm getting in the elevator. Stevie comes behind me and goes, hey, Shaq, what's up? Hit the floor that I live in. And he gets out of his floor and keeps going. <laughs> Shaq told this story. Then there's the other one that Lionel Richie started saying that um, he'd say, um, uh, fucking Stevie want to go to Lionel Richie. Yo, Lionel Richie, check this out. I got a I got a brand new song. Let's go into the car, and he backs out in the in the driveway, and that's it. And it was like, what the fuck? So there's this thing of like of that fucking uh, Stevie Wonder. Some people think you could see. That's nah. I mean, <laughs> that's crazy. No, I mean, how fucking crazy is that? But look, I mean, uh, you know, blind people. When you think blind, people say, "Oh, it's just black. Like that's all you see is black." It's not. Okay, you they see, see shadows shadow sometimes, yeah. Shadow. You could even see light, you could see gray and things like that. So people are not very few people are totally blind. Yeah. I'm sure he's um, Yeah. And you wanna hear the other funny. Do you hear that whole thing about um in Los Angeles, the fucking pilots that were seeing a guy in a fucking like in a in a rocket, like flying around in a like with a fucking oh, the jet, the jet pack guy? Yeah, what the fuck happened with that story? No, yeah. yeah, there was a flight coming in from somewhere into LAX. Yeah. And and it happened two planes in a row coming in or something. Reported to the tower that there's some guy flying around the airport in a jetpack. In a jetpack. Dude, think yeah. about how fucking weird that shit is. I'd love to have a jetpack, man. That'd be awesome. You, you ever remember the video we saw that... They, that they saw in South America, the fucking the guy flying around. Man in the sky or something, right? Huh? What, was it? what was it, like the man in the sky or something? The like man that? in the sky, the guy started yeah, praying. Oh, my God, what is that? Dude, what if these fucking people got a back? Jesus. They thought it was yeah. Jesus, right? <laughs> yeah. What if these people got a jetpack and they're doing it, you know, on the DL, fucking making it. So they don't really want to show you, but they're testing it out just to see how it works. It's, <laughs> How many times you see pilots? Pilots have got keen, keen feeling. And for them to say, dude, there was a guy with a jetpack. Why, why would you even make that story out? The guy, uh, the one, the one uh, pilot, I heard his, his uh, communication with the tower. He said, um, oh, I'm seeing a guy in a jetpack. Only in Los Angeles can this happen. Only in Los Angeles. <laughs> 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 that's, that's fucking pretty funny, man. Yeah. So, um, Mike, um, so so your final conclusion that you say is you 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 definitely think this guy was murdered, but you think what's the um what's the uh, contractor, or you think oh did the fucking uh, stone contract this guy to kill him? No, I, I I don't think the stones had anything to do with it. I I, I think that they probably was sick and tired of Brian and fired him. And he died a month later, but they weren't going to go to pieces over that. They, 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 they just kept moving. They already had a replacement guitarist. They had a tour plan. They needed. They were in. They were in bad financial straits at that point. If you remember, Exile on Main Street. They recorded that album in '72 because they were tax exiles. Oh yeah. There was a lot of money problems because they were paying like 90 percent tax rates on everything. Yeah. Nothing. So they had a lot of worries, I guess. They wanted to, the, the tour in November would be their most successful tour to that point. Okay. Money, money making in America. Wow. Um, anyway, actually, any tour that they did was that was the, the most money making up until that point. Um, 
Brian was just, I guess they had moved on, you know, but I believe it was the builder. Surrogate. It was the builder? Yeah. My, my whole concern is they had they a, killed, they, my concern was they're going to, huh? He keep cutting off. Can they kill him by, oh yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah, killed him on accident, okay? And, uh, you know, like I said, the, he, he drowned him in that trough and threw him in the pool to cover it up. And then there's a second level of conspiracy here, okay? Because the police changed the story around, changed the circumstances around to make it only about a drug and alcohol death. And there wasn't enough drugs and there wasn't enough alcohol in his body, to, according to the autopsy, to even show that. But nobody, wow. nobody could question it. And now there's a 75-year seal on the file. So no one can really get into this whole thing until long after anybody involved is dead. It's dead, yeah. yeah. And then they'll and, probably get into it. Yeah. I mean, it's really a tragic 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 story i mean brian jones to me uh i mean the stones are one of my all-time favorite bands so I, I like brian jones a lot because he founded that band but just in general i mean it's one of the most tragic stories in rock and roll there's no shortage of no. tragic stories in rock and roll but his is probably the most i think I the most think between him and uh richie brian brian dying in that fucking plane crash those are like Tragic story, you but, know, Buddy like, Holly. young guys, yeah, yeah, Buddy right. Holly, young, young yeah. guys. And you know what? This conspiracy on that too about why they picked the plane, well, I mean, the helicopter, or whatever the plane, because um, you know, Richie Vanners used to have like terrible fucking terror of flying. Why, why did he want to fly that day? What was going on? You know, but, uh, they were they were trying to get from one place to another on a tour and there was very bad weather. They didn't want to drive in it. They said, okay, we could, I think they said we could fly over it. We could fly but, over it. You know, but it, they couldn't and they went down. Fucking crazy, man. Crazy, yeah. man. Wow, wow. When it's time to go, it's time to go, man. How fucking crazy yep. is that? that? When your number's up, right? Yeah, it's crazy. So, Brian, uh, so, um, Rock and Mike, where can we get you? Okay, I'm on Instagram, Rocker Mike 212. I'm on Twitter, Rocker Mike 3. And I'm on Facebook under my name, Michael Baker. Also, we've got the Rock Show podcast group page. Check that out. Lots of interesting things on there. And where oh, can we find you, Rob? Somebody else died today that you put up. Toots? Oh, yeah. Toots from, was, to, toots, from toots in the Maytals, a reggae guy. Yes. Very sad day. He died of the coronavirus, 77. What, what's it, the coronavirus or they're saying the coronavirus? They, they, they didn't officially say it yet, but they think it is. Wow. Wow, at 77, passed away. Just came out with a new album a few weeks ago. Oh, shit, yeah? It was it's actually pretty good. I heard some of it already. Oh, yeah? How crazy is that? Take out a new crazy. album? Yeah, it was his first it's album in like 20 years. Wow. I wonder how long, was, how long did he work on it? Do you know that? A few months. Uh, me and me and Fayo and Sandy went to see him last year in Brooklyn. I know. I saw Fayo put something up about him. Yeah, yeah. We went to see him together. Yeah. Wow. All right. And um, you can always catch me on anything getting lumped up. Um, pretty much um, on Google, on um, um Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, anything left up. You can also get us on the Lumped Up um, um, fan page on uh, yep. Facebook. And, uh, Mike right. does a lot of work and he puts rock, a lot rock of... Show, uh, rock Show the Group rock Page. Show, the Rock Show Group Page. Um, and we put in a lot of stuff, a lot of effort in that. And um, we're also going to do the end of the month review. We're going to do a few um, episodes that we're going to need people to do a poll on, see what you guys want to hear for the last... Um, for the last December. four weeks of December, yeah. Yeah, go check that out on the Rock Show group page. And, um, Mike, we hit a mind, uh, mild, milestone next week. What's that? 60th episode. 60th episode of Conspiracy? Next, next week is the 60th episode. I think that Gotta one, come up with make, something good. 
we got we got to come up with something good, and I, I think um, I think uh, I think we we might have to go back to the Bible and uh, study some other oh. stuff. Uh, study some more um, some more ancient stuff, stuff that were in the Bible that that you can get that gave you mystical power supposedly from um, from people looking for Samson hair because if they find the hair, you can control <laughs> it. People are out of the fucking mind. Do you ever hear? You ever you ever seen that thing on TV? That they were setting like wood from the the, the the cross of Christ, right? Wood from the true cross, yeah. For the true, you haven't seen that. They, they've sold so much wood from the from the, the <laughs> bridge with it. The, 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 it's fucking insane. So we're gonna make fun of stuff that I've been saw on TV that supposedly Christ has touched but never touched. For me, with the shroud, you ever seen the shroud that supposedly he cleaned his face and his face is on it? Yeah, how crazy. Yeah. yeah, so we'll talk a little bit about stuff Thanks. like that. And so I think the 60th show will be a special show. Go a little bit back to uh, conspiracy in the Bible. Okay, I'm into it. How does that sound? Sounds good to me, buddy. All right, Mike. So I'll talk to you Monday. And remember, guys, don't, don't get, get drunk. drunk. Get, get lumped, lumped up. up. See you Take soon. Care. Bye.